Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. We're going further afield today. Nigerian businessman Jim Ovia, founder and chairman of Zenith Bank, is launching his book Africa Rise and Shine this week. Peace Hyde caught up with him to discuss the book and his lessons for business success. It's an honor to have you join us today, Mr. Ovia. Now, you've had an exceptional career as one of the leading bankers of our time, with a career culminating in building a giant that is Zenith Bank. Now, you started this with a vision. Did you ever imagine that it would turn out to be such a huge empire? The most important thing when you start a career, sometimes you are not 100% certain where the career might take you. You do baby steps at a time, baby steps at a time. And if you're going to jump into a big river, a swimming pool, you tiptoe, first of all, to test the hard deep it is. Then before you start swimming, you don't just jump in like that. So building your career is always a very interesting thing. It's a life-changing stages of events. Then from one event to the other, one activity to the other, until it becomes a successful story. It's not as if you know from the one that the career you started at a very young age, age of 20, that would take you to greater heights or not. You just need to do the right thing, be very focused, be very determined, very hardworking, be very persistent, and, and that is it. Congratulations on becoming a published author. Your new book, Africa Rise and Shine, is an absolutely amazing read. Talk to me a bit about the catalyst that set you on the path to document such a detailed journey. Now, those catalysts are things that you never, ever would have thought about. It's a gradual process from starting a career at a young age to beginning to empower people, beginning to offer leadership, and run successful businesses, gradually, gradually, it becomes a successful business. And you never one day begin to articulate all the stages you've taken. It's only after or towards the end of the journey that you then realize you must document the process you have taken for the past 20 years, or if you will, almost about 30 years. Then you then realize that it needed to be documented because you would have already read books of successful entrepreneurs all over the world or even um, in the country. Just that in Nigeria, we may not have too many books well documented to describe the various stages, the adversity individual entrepreneurs had encountered. Nigerian entrepreneurs have done a great deal, have done a lot, but it's just that some of the activities had not been adequately documented which I thought we needed to document most of the things we've done in building the Zenith Empire. Now, in the book, one of the things that you highlight is your early days of building Zenith Bank, um, where you started in a small space with a private tenant and his wife, I believe. Can you tell me a little bit about those early days? I mean, it was a very simple beginning. What was it like for you? Now, it's a matter of time and chance again, because at that time, you're talking about in 1990, there were not too many high profile, office building, or purpose build office complexes. There were, not, there were not really too many. We have to do makeshift structures, or, or just a duplex building. You knock down the wall, change the roof, change the facade, and change the banking hall. There was no banking hall at that time, but we have to now create one. In our particular case, we converted a garage to a customer service. We converted some of the rooms to a telepoint area to create our first branch at Ajose Adiogu. The truth of the matter was that there was a tenant sharing the duplex with us, and the tenant, uh, him and his wife, one of the wings, but the noise of uh, vehicles, cars coming in and the bullion vine um, blaring the sarin was a great nuisance for the customers. So. He became a customer eventually for the tenant that he had to move out. Why we were sorry that he moved out, but at the same time, it created an opportunity for us to have more space to do banking business because we ended up making profit, paying a lot of tax to the government and employing a lot of people. 
Those were the early days. Now, I think one of my favorite things about this book is that it highlights the principles to your entrepreneurial journey that has shaped you to become the success story that you are today. Can you share any of those keys with us? Yeah, the, the most important thing was the branding yes. and uh, also building the logo, yeah. choosing the color red. I remember vividly when I chose the color red, some of my friends, colleagues said, look, you can use red for a bank because red is, signifies danger or war. And many banks at that time were using either blue color, dark blue, light blue, even yellow. No bank ever used red. They thought it was really out of place to use red as a color of a bank. But I insisted I had to use red. And because red signifies power, love. Remember Valentine, it's red. And some of the most powerful countries in the world, economically developed countries in the world, they have red as part of their logo. USA, Great Britain, um, Russia, China. All these powerful countries, they all use red, even um, uh, Japan. They use red as part of their logo. So there must be a reason why these countries have chosen red. So I insisted on red, and it gave us a great deal of uh, attention, a great deal of attraction, and sooner or later, everybody loved the red. So what was the process like writing a book? You're a very accomplished banker, but an author is new territory for you. There's so many years of rich experiences to share. How could you decide which aspects of your life made it into the book? You've featured the Harvard Art Lecture, you've spoke about building civic towers. How could you choose which particular areas made the cut? You have to choose the aspects of activities as you continue to build businesses that were very dramatic, that created a great deal of drama, not just within your mind, but in the, in the public space that people appear to like, appear to pay attention to, and had asked numerous questions over and over again, or they wanted to share part of the stories. That was very easy for me to decide. It was very easy, and I was relating and reflecting the mindset of the public, what they wanted to know, what they wanted to see, or events that they insisted they wanted to revisit over and over again. I knew those events had to be in the book. That's why the choices were made so simple for me. So you have a very strong focus on young entrepreneurs stepping out and creating opportunities for themselves and not waiting for the government to solve their problems. What advice can you share for those who are already in the process of doing this, but they're still struggling to find their breakthrough? No, the young entrepreneurs must be empowered. We needed to empower them, for them to blossom their businesses. Young entrepreneurs, will, they may have great ideas. For those ideas to fertilize, they needed the right um, um, government support. Support from government will always come in form of, if you will, um, uh, various government initiatives and also Successful stories will also help to propel and empower those youth to do well. Now, one of the key things you mentioned in the book, Africa Rise and Shine, is an article by The Economist in 2000, where you actually mentioned that they dubbed Africa as a hopeless continent to them changing their narrative 10 years later to now Africa rising, with several people still struggling with unemployment, especially amongst the youth in different countries, in an all-time high. I mean, is Africa really arising? Definitely. The reason why I picked those specific um, economics uh, cover pages was because, I mean, like a decade apart. In 2000, the reason why the economists I found out chose the title that Africa is a hopeless country was simply because right at that time or before then, quite a number of African countries were ruled by the military. There were no, only very few African countries were enjoying proper democratically elected government. Either one coup or the other, 
So they looked at Africa as a continent that is, you know, uh, plagued by military coup d'etat or border crisis or tribal wars, hunger, famine. That was their own mindset about Africa. Even today, if you Google uh, to search for Africa, and the description you're going to get in many cases is there's an autocomplete, a, a continent of wars, hungers. You're going to see there more that you see opportunities for investment, or you see research entrepreneurs, or research opportunities. You are likely to see that if you dig further. But the first autocomplete you see in Google, when you Google about Africa, it's going to say it's a continent of wars, you know, famine, crisis, hunger, and all that. But in 2011, 2011, what you will see then was Africa truly rising. African countries, uh, including Nigeria, we began to experience proper democratically elected government. Um, the military had handed over in Nigeria, and the first democratically elected government was in 1999, after the British had handed over. And um, in South Africa, Mandela was released from jail. He became president in 1994. And of course, he, South Africa went through democratically elected government, and Mandela did one term handed over again in 1999. So you could really see, and again, more importantly, in year 2010, Africa was allowed to hold the first ever World Cup in Africa in Johannesburg. And it was a success story. Therefore, we can all appreciate and understand the fact that in 2011, then the economist cover page simply read Africa. You know, rising continent, or if you will, Africa rising. That was the basis of my book, Africa Rise and Shine. I feel that the book has so much that someone can learn from it, but what would you say personally is your main takeaway that you expect entrepreneurs or any reader really to take away from your book? It's not going to be one message, it's going to be multiple of messages. I encourage anyone who wants to buy copies of the book to read there's so much to learn from there, from experiences some of us have gone through, from adversities we went through, how we survived some of those adversities, how we survived um, a situation of where we couldn't really be trusted because we're so, you, we're so young at that point in time. We couldn't really be trusted by the older generations. We needed to go through those kind of adversities. The resources were not easily available, infrastructure wasn't much available. So those are the adversities that we went through. So reading the book will teach or we add as part of, um, if you will, consulting or advisory for young entrepreneurs, for startup businesses, or how to survive under difficult circumstances. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Talking Books. Thanks for watching.